Rolling up. Chapter 1. Train to work. It didn't take me long to get into the swing of working life. Up, out of bed, a quick wash and a snatched breakfast. Then a quick dash down the road to reach the station in time to catch the seven o'clock train for Wembley Park. In 1950 there were still steam trains running on the brown liveried Metropolitan Line. The, gra the slam door carriages held a dozen passengers, all intent upon trying to read their newspapers whilst packed together like sardines. My journey lasted thirteen minutes, stopping at three stations. At the fourth, the doors opened to discourse half the passengers, myself amongst them. Not stopping for breath, I and the other Macintosh pa paper-carrying passengers forced a way over to the other side of the platform. There we pushed our way into the underground train, already waiting at the platform, not needing to be reminded to mind the gap as the doors slid shut. Gasping for breath, I attempted to glance at the Daily Mail to check the printing vac vacancies, clinging as I did so to the overhead strap. All the other passengers... Hundreds of other expressionist workers swayed to the hypnotic clickety-clack as the train travelled along the track towards Neesden. This was the start to a lifetime of travelling up to London, a habit-forming ritual as I and every other passenger fought for space and isolation, engrossed in their books or reading for the umpteenth time the advertising streamers opposite. My destination, Neesden, was a rather dingy outreach of Wilston Green, a place where trolley buses still ran, receiving their power from overhead lines. Neesden's most important employer was British Rail, who operated the railway sidings. Reputed to be one of Britain's largest good yards, work went on round the clock, where railway enthusiasts could always see great activity and register numerous working engine numbers. Obviously the sidings, importance, were internationally known for numerous Nazi hit-and-raid runs, damaged the tracks and further defaced the Victorian terraced houses that lined the perimeter fence. It had never been a place of any pretense or elegance, even when first built, languishing as it did so between Blackbird Cross and Wilston High Road. The rows of terraced housing, three up, two down, were purpose-built for railway workers and their families. Along with hundreds of others, I joined the stream of hurrying workers marching up the stairs, like the march of the troglodytes, past the booking hall out into the street, and there to turn right onto the pavement leading down the hill past the railings. Trying to walk the, on the pavement was a feat in itself, ducking in and out, now one foot in the gutter, the other on the curb, jostling with the rest of the early birds down the hill as the human tide surged about me. Sheltering behind the hoardings from the wind, I strode on, past British Thompson Houston and Dow Myers Optical Works to Cromer Works, perched on the Wilston High Road, behind some unimposed ra iron railings which corralled the car park. Opposite, the showroom windows of Coach Builders Park Ward reflected and distorted the polished Rolls-Royce cars that lent an aura of respectability to the whole neighbourhood. Just along the road, a forlorn café perched next to a paper shop, a rather seedy establishment that sold sweets and cigarettes. It was here that I bought my cigarettes in packets of five with a book of matches. When times were extra hard, which was almost weekly, the cheapest brands, weights, woodbines or turf could be purchased one at a time to become my saviour from for depression, boredom and at times shattered confidence when jobs went wrong. Reaching the gate, I braced myself before entering, remembering that I must order the men's cheese rolls and dinner choices early, and with that thought in mind, I passed the canteen. I was usually the first to clock in, and in inserting the card, I jerked down the handle, 7.30 in purple ink, and I started off down the long corridor past the warehouse, printing shop and stairs leading up to the grainers, past the lavatory, turned left and there, on the right, the sliding door surrounded by large printing plates propped handily against each wall. Hardly an imposing entrance or welcoming sight. Nevertheless, it was the firm's artist's studio. The smell of turps and printing ink greeted me as I made my way into the large airy room. 
I headed for the store cupboard to fetch out the enamel plate and stick of ink. Where rubbing the ink stick on the plate, I splashed a small amount of water in and started to rub my finger round and round to mix up the ink into a creamy, opaque mixture. I wondered how many times apprentices had gone through a similar introduction to their working day. Just outside the room, along the corridor, the machine shop burst into life. The machine assistants fetched tins of ink from the store. The machine minders opened the tins and troweled some onto their mixing slabs, and there they worked the ink, oil and dryers together to form the correct consistency. As the inking slabs resounded to the slap of pallet knives that pummeled and squeezed out the ink. The printing plates, wrapped around the plate cylinder, were damped over with a sponge-soaked water that also removed the gum layer. The brakes squealed as they stopped the cylinder turning. The machine minder scraped the mixed ink into the inking duct and laid on a pallet knife full of ink to the rollers. Then the warning bell was rung as power was switched on and the cylinders revolved and the sheeting lever released as the vacuum pumps puffed and sucked, opening and closing the sheet feeders. The hiss of the ink-coated rollers as they came into contact with each other and the click of the gripper's release gear letting go the paper. The stack began to grow. The warehouse girls, feeding in the paper, burst into song, bewitched, bothered and bewildered, as they positioned the next sheet against the lay bars. The minder rushed round to the front of the machine to extract a sheet to check the register and colour. This was the scene at all printing firms throughout the country. I love the activity, the rhythmic sounds and the evocative smells, being in the company of other skilled workers all contributing to creating what I thought to be a work of art, part of an age-old printing industry with skills and routines that had hardly changed from its conception a hundred years before. Lithographic printing is a chemical process, using a surface image rather than raised for letterpress or sunken for engraving. The lithographic process was discovered in 1798 by fortuitous accident. Alloy Senefelder, a book and music publisher of Munich, grasped the significance of a dampened non-image area which repelled greasy black ink. Hand-drawn colour lithographs printed from stones or metal plates, is the only commercial reproduction method to stimulate, simulate drawings with a brush, crayon or pencil. Both the production of letterpress blocks and engraved plates are stilted mechanical process which lacked artistic freedom. The hand-drawn lithographic reproduction has a random chalk image that does not rely upon a mechanical screened image at all to show the gradations of tone. The first lithographic printing surface was that of a smooth, locally hewn limestone which retained its quality, remained damp when water was applied. Later, grained aluminium and zinc plates took the place of stone, a surface medium able to be wrapped round a printing cylinder. Kelheim limestones were cut in the quarry three or four inches thick for various machine sizes, then given rounded edges and corners. The stones then either polished or grained depending on the size of the run and the quality required. Initially, Semifelder used a smooth, ungrained surface to write his music. When illustrating his work, he produced tone work with a pen and ink to produce stipple work, dots, or scraped away a solid patch to give a line cross hatched or wood block effect. Later, for commercial jobs, the stone surface grained to allow cray crayon work to be used, to give a pencil tint. Graining also increases the surface area, allowing the dampening effect of water to last longer, allowing a greater number of prints to be made. The stone's grained surface is produced by rotating a levigator, trade name for a hand-spun sp metal wheel, mimicking a corn mill or spinning two stones in contact, grained two stones simultaneously. Both these methods use graded qualities of silica sand as aggregate, plus copious amounts of water. Old work were, was removed by the same process. 
steel straight edges provided an accurate level and when graining metal plates the same principle applied a graining machine oscillates as a rotating bed using various sizes of metal or glass marbles depending on the finished grain size required with a stone or metal plate the final grain surface is washed and prepared using a very weak acetic acid cleans the surface by removing any grease particles giving the surface an even greater grease receptiveness the lithographic hand press uses both the principles of a letterpress screw press for pressure the engraver's reciprocating press to produce a larger print size and the operation of a scraper bar on the tin pan to give greater direct pressure the first hand press using the same principle as a closed mangle plus a scraper blade instead of a wooden roller was built at the turn of the 18th century just after the discovery of the process. Fifty years later, in 1850, lithogra lithography became the premier printing process for monotone and colour. My work as an apprentice and during training used exactly the same type and age of hand press. The artist studio, my responsible to keep, respons responsibility to keep tidy, had a high ceiling strung with suspended flor fluorescent lights. The tall metal framed windows, glazed with wired hammered safety glass, let in a filtered glittering light, still clothed to the higher panes with a crisscross of sticky brown paper, there to guard against shattering caused by London's blitz. The walls, painted a light mustard colour, gave a mellow look to the otherwise harsh interior. Painted below the dado line, breaking up the expanse of tobacco-stained wall colour, was mid-grey, and those areas that could be seen unbroken by racks of zinc plinting plates propped against the walls. The stained and uneven floorboards were raised where the nails and hard polished knots protected the surface defied gradual wear. They smelt of turps and benzene. The planked surface blackened with chalk shavings, cigarette burns and scratched by the edges of hundreds of metal plates dragged over them, testified to many years of service. The large wooden benches, massive legs capable of supporting heavy stones, arranged to give access to all sides, their owner protected by dark grey warehouse coat stretched across their surface, attending to a chalked tint or penned letter. The atmosphere, the smells, the rustles, the same as years gone by when the process was discovered. In 1822 it was demonstrated that by overprinting several colours, the lithographic process could make a reasonable reproduction of a coloured original, even though the number of copies limited. Commercially, the chromolithographic process began in 1850. Previously, all printing work had been in black and white line, image, in monochrome. The public anticipated colour, and so did the advertisers. To some extent, hand colouring prints didn't produce the desired effect, but and only for limited editions, not for the mass market. Letterpress and lithography both vied with each other to produce many copies of a commercially acceptable coloured reproduction which matched the artwork. Chromolithography won, but not for long. The changes that did come about to the lithographic and letterpress processes in the first hundred years concerned mechanics, not principle. The use of metal rather than wood in the construction of the press and the type. Later, the use of rotary action rather than reciprocation further advanced each process until finally conversion of the coloured continuous tone picture by the photographic half-tone principle. The photographic reproduction of coloured originals had a relatively short lifespan. Eventually, in the 1980s, the electronic revolution began by introducing colour scanners ink and laser jet printing. When a new job was estimated for a hand-drawn lithographic reproduction, 
a decision of how many colours were required as the first consideration. Obviously, if the job is for a cinema poster, the number of colours would be less than for a fra facsimile of a fine art reproduction. The average number for a commercial reproduction is eight. Buff, yellow, flesh, blue, black, red, pink and grey. A swatch or tab of each colour to be printed is stuck onto a piece of card to remind the artist exactly what colour he is working to and to give the printer a guide when mixing his colours. Multicolour printings must register on the sheet of paper. The artist needs an anchor accurate tracing to use as a guide to reproduce the original and to achieve this the artist traces an outline guide. This guide is called the key and it gives an exact position of each colour, shape, shade, brush stroke, shadow and highlight. To position this correctly on the paper, register marks are added for the printer. A guideline on each stone or plate has to be non-greasy. Either the original tracing has to be retraced onto as many plates and stones that are to be used using a non-greasy set-off powder or the key line traced in Conti crayon and rubbed down. Commercially, a, a keystone or plate is drawn, a black ink pool taken and the wet ink line dusted with purple set-off powder and the key pressed onto as many stones or plates as necessary. Each printing stone or machine plate with its faint purple line image can now be drawn up in black ink or crayon to represent the weight of, co the weight of colour to be printed. The artist will use pen line and stippling, bende tinting mediums, splatter work, airbrushing, flat crayoning and finger tinting, jumper work, sharpen crane, sponge and stump work. There are many, many ways of creating an image on a plate. Incorrect work on the plate can be removed using blotting paper soaked in benzene for both ink or crayon work and an echo stick a chalk stone, on a wet stone or plate when proving. Care should always be taken not to remove the grain, especially on a zinc plate, for that might create a scum of half removed work when printing. No method is perfect or wholly reliable on metal plates, for utmost cleanliness is essential at all times. The limestone, being relatively soft, allows its surface to be engraved, scraped, carved or etched. Before starting to draw each colour, all non-image areas should be painted with gum arabic to desensitise the stone surface. This prevents dirt, dust, finger marks or stray grease affecting the clean paper areas. Improving the image, the, the printing stone or plate has to be drawn ready for printing. The image should be proved to secure the work and to make sure that what is on the printing surface is what is wanted. There are three reasons why proving the image has to take place. 1. The artist drawing ink and crayon doesn't contain a sufficiently greasy content to ensure a permanent image. A more grease receptive image has to replace the drawn one. 2. Before printing, the printing surface has to be scrupulously clean, showing only that which is to be printed. And 3. The printing image must be capable of producing multiple impressions. When preparing the image for proving, the completed ink and chalk work drawing is dusted with French chalk. Using a shaker and cotton wool puff, this prevents the work smudging when gummed up. The stone or plate is gummed up using a sponge soaked in gum arabic solution to cover the whole plate surface to prevent smearing or interfering with the image in any way. You dab over the dusty work and you don't rub it, else that would smear it. Gum arabic crystals melt in water to make a thin creamy consistency. Test for tack between finger and thumb. Applying gum arabic desensitizes the non-image areas and makes the non-image areas water receptive. If the gum arabic solution is too watery, 
there is a danger that you will remove some of the fine chalk work. Similarly, too thick, the solution will scrub the image. You do not add any acid to the first application of gum solution for the same reason. The solution will be usable a few weeks, steadily becoming acidic, which 